Now to move on to the next nominee, Mr. Chris Weber. C. Webb played for a year in Golden State before going to Washington, which is, of course, where I got to know him during his four years there. And we know how good he was in Sacramento before he then bounced around a little bit and ended up back with the Warriors in 2007. Tom, make the case for C. Webb. How are his 20 points and 10 boards stacked up? There's going to be a lot of debate here for C. Webb, but for me, it's not a debate. You look at his per-game numbers in his career. These are career averages of 20.7 points, 9.8 rebounds, 4.2 assists. The guys who have done that in their entire career, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, Larry Bird, and Billy Cunningham, four of the greatest players of all time. And then there's Chris Webber. This guy was a production machine and one of the best passing bigs ever to play the game of basketball. So for me, again, it's not a debate. I think Chris Webber should be it. What did you like about seeing Chris play? Uh, I like the fact that uh, Chris had... Uh... A, a varied kind of game. He, he, he'd back you in sometimes, sometimes he'd face you up, uh, sometimes he'd take it on on the uh, dribble and find people that were open. I, I think that's what made his game uh, so uh, adaptable to the different teams that he played on. Well, we have another big man on the list to get to, Ben Wallace. You know, he's only listed at 6'9", 240 pounds, and his numbers, I mean, they aren't the exceptional numbers, but it is a good thing the Basketball Hall of Fame is about more than numbers. Wallace was a ferocious competitor from 96 to 2012, Defensive Player of the Year four times, five All-Star Game appearances, NBA title in 2004. Kareem, when you've got a guy like this who doesn't have maybe the stats, but you know what kind of player he was in those Defensive Player of the Year awards. We're talking about blue collar here, all right? This is a blue collar guy. He goes out there and works in the trenches, uh, not very pretty, uh, not a whole lot of flashy stats, but uh, you end up winning games with guys like that. I, I played with a couple guys like that. <laughs> yes, you did. A guy named Cupjack, a guy named Rambus. You know, they make things happen uh, and uh, usually have a lot of nights where they got bruises, but uh, their teams win. Well, he, he, or if he gets in, he will have earned it for sure, Tom. What do you, what do you make of uh, Ben's chances I'm, here? I mean... Four-time Defensive Player of the Year. Look at this blind resume here. Player number one versus player number two. Looks pretty comparable. Absolutely, um, right? But fact, actually, the guy on the left, he's the one who's got the title. We count that. Yeah. Uh, actually, I would, I would say player one has a better resume, yeah. right? Right, Kareem? What do you think? Well, yeah, absolutely. Well, guess what? The, ah. the other player, too, that's to Kevin Mutombo in the Hall of Fame already. Ben Wallace stacks up very nicely against him. Also with Dennis Rodman. This is, uh, I think, Ben Wallace... In terms of defensively, one of the best guys of this era, and I think in terms of what he did to Shaq in the 2004 <laughs> final, if you look at those highlights, it's crazy the stuff right. that he was doing against Shaq, who was twice the size of him. Well, it'll be interesting to see how much the voters value that kind of stuff versus some of the other stuff that we talked about. And keep in mind the story of Ben Wallace, undrafted, coming yeah. into the NBA to have that career. Most games played by an undrafted player in NBA history. What a story for Ben Wallace. Gotta count for something. All right, from big man to the smallest of the small, but in height only. Five foot three, his frame made you grasp the gasp when you first saw him, but come on, Muggsy Bogues could finish, right? Pass, layup, it wasn't hard to tell that he belonged in the NBA. He didn't just play, he ran the point for several teams during his career. Most of them coming in Charlotte, where he played for 10 seasons. That was where we saw most of these highlights. But, Tom, how strong a case can you make for Muggsy? Now, I'm biased because I went to Wake Forest as well. Yeah. Um, I'm <laughs> right. going to just say that. This okay, is a so Carolina blue tie. You're going to have to stop talking. We'll go to Korea now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to show you a graphic here, which is amazing. There is uh, one player in NBA history who is 5'3". Uh, that's Muggsy Bogues. And it's just amazing, not just that he got to the NBA, but look at that's a lit that's a plot of players in the NBA with a long career as many games as Muggsy Bogues played 889 games and look at the height that bar on the left side there is the height that's of basketball amazing. players who played as many games as Muggsy Bogues did and there he is way By down himself. below he is 16 inches shorter than the average long career in the NBA I mean think about and shorter How? than me. Someone who's shorter than me could make the Hall of Fame. I'm <laughs> just about excited that. about that. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, Muggsy is a, is a great testimony to the fact that speed kills. All right? right. So you got somebody handling the ball that's close to the ground, can move it around and uh, find the guys that's open. That's a skill that uh, generates to uh, wins on the basketball court, even though... Uh, his height wouldn't make you think that that was possible. There he is. <laughs> we have all these committees for the Hall of Fame. I think we have, need to have a short person's committee, but I might be a little biased about that. We do have a <laughs> women's committee of nominees that are going to surely make it through. Rebecca Lobo played six years in the WNBA, but 
This is a basketball hall of fame, so it's for all kinds of basketball. And she is, of course, known for helping UConn win the 1995 National Championship, leading those great UConn teams 35-0 and on that season. I mean, it was breathtaking. Tom, what do you make the case for her? I'll make the case just on a personal level. I grew up in Connecticut, and she was bigger this than Jordan. It's not the Tom Haverstrow show. I'm, I'm just saying she was bigger. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> It's not like Kareem is a big deal or anything <laughs> exactly. like that. Come on. She's bigger than bigger than Jordan, bigger than Ray Allen at UConn. I mean, she is. Yes. I mean, UConn wasn't number one until she got there. No, and that's that a great since. local perspective, seriously, because you have Ray Allen, you have Rebecca Lobo. It's Rebecca Lobo that people were worshiping. That was out it there. on the Connecticut Post. That was it. Yes. Plus, uh, she inspired so many young girls to take the game up and go out, go on and go for it mm-hmm. and play basketball. You know, there's sometimes it's hard to get the. The females to uh, participate. Uh, you, they saw someone like her going out there and uh, playing with class and determination. Uh, they followed her, and uh, you know now women's basketball has has found its niche. Absolutely, part of a cultural change, and of course, still a member of our ESPN team, broadcasting some games for us. Teresa Witherspoon, synonymous with the New York Liberty. She spent eight years there, including the 1997 inaugural WNBA season. Tom, what you got for Witherspoon? Uh, can we just show the shot that she had? <laughs> I mean, one of the most iconic shots in Teaspoon. just not just NBA or WNBA. One of the most iconic shots there in the finals, where she hit a, ha- a half court shot. Uh, to send it into uh, extend the game. I mean, I'm, I'm I don't know. I don't watch too much about a WNBA. I just know that that shot is one of the most Ooh. amazing Come things on. I've ever right? seen. Look at, everyone look at the thought face it was over. Of everyone on the court. That's what's so amazing. The confetti was coming down. <laughs> Here are the other women's committee nominees. That includes Notre Dame coach Muffet McGraw. She's won over 700 games in South Bend. Kim Mulkey, she's won over 400 games, and her current position is Baylor's women's coach. So really some incredible nominees there. All right, coming up on this special edition of The Jump, we're going to talk coaches. We've got international nominees, but let's go to break with a look at the rest of the North American Committee player nominations. Enjoy. The Jump is presented by Dewar's, the world's most awarded blended scotch whiskey. Live true. Drink responsibly. Welcome back to The Jump, presented by Dewar's. To the jump, we are unveiling the nominations for the 2017 Hall of Fame class, and let's turn our attention to the North American coaches that have been nominated. Here is the list. Here, now I'm a Maryland girl. We're doing all of like where we grew up. Leslie oh. Brazil, obviously a big deal. Switching to your show now, right? right? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> this is Kareem's show. Let's not let's not <laughs> mess this up at all. He's the Hall of Famer on the Basketball Hall of Fame show, and really any room Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is in, it's Kareem's show. Uh, we want to talk about a few of these guys. Let's discuss Coach Rudy Tomjanovich, who of course led the Rockets to back-to-back titles in the mid-90s. He was also a five-time All-Star as a player. You know, uh, some controversial stuff with a punch in his NBA career as a player, but then he went on to such a coaching career. I, I think really that's the lasting image a lot of people, today's basketball fan, might have of him. Exactly, Tom, yeah. What do you think about his chances? Uh, I think he, I think he should have been already. I mean, when you look at his resume and the fact his that that Rockets team, when they won the titles in 94, 95, they broke the record for three-point attempts. I mean, it's nowhere near what it is now, uh, half as much. But that team was the first one, in my opinion, to use that weapon effectively. And I think in terms of lasting impact on the game, that kind of set the path for the next well, couple yeah, of decades. Yeah, it kind of uh, showed how the evolution uh, was starting to happen, yeah. you know, that uh, they were able to be successful shooting three-point shots and... Uh, some people came along 10 years later and <laughs> just blew that out of the water. They've done a little bit of that. You, you, you yeah. sort of, you had an interesting face when I was talking about him. Why do you think he isn't in the Hall of Fame yet since Tom said he was surprised he's not in there yet? Uh, I don't know. You know, he didn't coach for a very long time, but he, uh, winning two uh, back-to-back, that's, that's that a tough thing to do. You know, that, that was a, a very tough era, and uh, his teams, uh, they, they were consistent. I think, uh, you know, he, he's 
he should have a good chance of making it. A five-time All-Star as a player, then you combine the fact that he was a two-time NBA champion as a coach, uh, the all-time, I believe, the all-time winningest coach for the Houston Rockets franchise. So when you put the playing career and the actual coaching career, I'm just so surprised he's not already, not already in there. Um, so I think I think when you put his playing and his coaching, I mean, he's got a great resume. Right. Yeah, he did really good job as the, as a player, uh, consistent with the jump shot, uh, got some rebounds, uh, played some defense. You know, he had a good all around game and uh, was a contributor. Uh, you know, both ends of the court. Played some defense. Some defense. Yeah, some defense. <laughs> some defense. I want to turn yeah. our attention to the international committee nominations. Here they are. Take a look here. We're going to, uh, yeah, Tony Kukoc obviously has a lot of rings to his uh, resume here. And uh, the one we want to talk about the most, though, is Vlade Divac, who hails from Serbia, of course, played 16 seasons in the NBA. Now, of course, it's a very different position in the game uh -huh. over there in Sacramento. But, Kareem, what did you most like about Vlade as a player? Well, I, I thought that uh, Vlade brought the European game to the NBA, you know, in, in, in being a, a center who was going to play a whole lot of different spots on the court, at, at the free throw line, top of the key. Sometimes he did some post-up work, but he, he was all over the place more in, in the European style. I thought that uh, really kind of opened that up for them to come and uh, continue to contribute. And I think in terms of impact on the game, mm -hmm. I, I want to say flopping is what he was known for. But I think taking charges, come on, come I'm on, saying Tom. taking charges. This is a beautiful day. He's being I'm not nominated for the Hall of Fame. I'm saying if you want to see the impact of his game, he was one of the first guys to really employ the value of the charge, which in many ways gets yeah. you more wins than, than actually going for the block shot. So he was, I think, impactful. Not just that, but you see there, traded for Kobe Bryant. So without Vladi Divac, I don't think really... Maybe the, the legacy of Kobe Bryant in L.A., I don't know. I don't know. So That's in terms of lasting point. impact, right? Vladi, uh, internationally and as a humanitarian, I think he's, uh, I think he's a great candidate. He, he kind of joins, uh, joins forces there with uh, Gail Goodrich, mm -hmm. who was uh, traded for Magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Lakers franchise would never be the same. It is fascinating, all yeah. these little tributaries in the game. And, and you bring up the point about him being a European player in an era where there was so much skepticism still and right. you had to fit in with your teammates and fit in and get credit for what you were able to do. So I think that falls into the category. As we're as talking well. about, they're not tough. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, C. Webb as a passer with him and Vladi together, one fun. of the best passing duos in the, in the front court. Be interesting if they got to go in together. All right, we got to take another quick break first, but here are the early African-American Pioneers Committee nominations. Take a look at these. The Jump is presented by Doers, the world's most awarded blended Scotch whiskey. Live true, drink responsibly. 